Well, once again, praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's great to see those of you here healthy and in God's good hands. Uh, we thank God for that. I'd like to ask you to take your Bibles this morning once again and turn back to the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. We are very quickly coming to that time when we shall consider our Lord Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. The reality that Jesus, the innocent, spotless Lamb of God, should die in our place will be set before us here very shortly. We're not there yet, but we're getting there very quickly. What we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at uh, our Lord Jesus Christ as he stands before Pilate. We'll consider the final aspect of the Jewish trial that our Lord Jesus Christ underwent. Uh, the religious leaders will take him before Pilate, having convicted him wrongly of blasphemy. Uh, they will set him before Pilate and they will change, they will morph their religious charge into a political charge against the Lord Jesus Christ. They accuse them of blasphemy because he properly and truly confessed that he is the Son of God, the Christ that should come into the world to save sinners. And they will take that and they will morph that into a, into a civil charge. They will set before Pilate this accusation that he makes himself to be a king, that he refuses to pay taxes, that he is stirring up the people into insurrection. And by this, they will attempt to get Pilate to do literally their dirty work. They will attempt to have Pilate put Jesus Christ to death and to crucify him. It's very interesting, this whole reality of Jesus having to be crucified. In this way, he fulfills not only Old Testament prophecy, prophecy by the type of death that he must die, he also fulfills the prophecy of his own words. Jesus Christ must die on the cross. Why on the cross? Because he must die accursed. He must die under the curse of God. And the scriptures tell us that all who hang on a tree are cursed of God. Jesus Christ bears my curse for my sin. He bears your curse for your sin. Jesus Christ, again, in one glorious aspect, is, is overseeing all this. The Father from heaven is overseeing all this. And yet, at the same time, we do see much by way of human treachery. We see, again, the vile actions of the religious leaders. We see again the, the uh, I, I almost want to say the inept actions of Pilate, but Pilate was not an inept man. A Pilate was not a buffoon. A Pilate was not some man that was uh, out of his league, so to speak. Pilate was very much a, a politically capable individual. But we will see here that Pilate is, un, Pilate is undone or Pilate is outfoxed uh, by these shrewd religious leaders. It's an amazing thing to see, and we will consider that here today. But what I wanted to set before you, again, even before we get into the, uh, ask the uh, passage that we're going to be looking at, and we're going to be in Mark 15, I think I said turn to Mark 14, I meant to say turn to Mark 15, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 14, but before we do that, I want to set before you a review of what we considered last week. Do you remember what we considered last week? We considered last week the denials of the Apostle Peter, of his knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it was a very sad thing to see. This man who we know loved the Lord Jesus Christ, this man who, again, we look up, look up to in very many ways, uh, this man who, who had professed the faithfulness to Jesus Christ even to his dying breath, this man, again, being in a situation where he denied Christ, and he denied Christ in such a telling way. You remember that when our Lord, when, when, uh, when Peter was confronted with these accusations that he was a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, he denied it in three ways. The first thing that he said to the woman who accused him uh, of being a follower of Jesus, he said, I don't even know what you're talking about. And Peter tried to just play it off as though he had no idea of what this was all about. There he was in that inner courtyard, and there he was around that fire warming himself with those who in some way, shape, or form were very much involved in the proceedings of that night. And Peter again trying to pass this whole thing off as, I don't even know what you're talking about. The next uh, accusation that came to Peter was that, Peter, you were actually one of his disciples. We saw you with him. You were a follower of hers, uh, of his. And Peter's saying again now more vigorously, I don't, I, 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 I'm not a follower of his. I, I'm not one of his disciples. And then the third denial of Peter was the most telling, the most hurtful, I believe. It was when Peter said to his accusers, I don't even know the man. Could you imagine being brought to a place where you were called to give account for your knowledge of Christ, 
in your following of Christ, and in the in the in, in maybe the the, uh, the 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 uncertainty or the or the frightfulness of the moment, saying, "I don't know what you're talking about," and then somebody saying, "Don't tell me that. I saw you going down to that church every week." He said, "No, I, I wasn't. That wasn't me." And then saying, you went there and you worshiped Jesus Christ. And you said, I don't even know who Jesus of Nazareth is. Could you imagine saying these things? Could you imagine how Peter felt when he said these things? Can you imagine how Peter felt when Jesus Christ placed his eyes on Peter in that moment when he was denied and the rooster was crowing? Could you imagine these things? Well, all this was going on. And this was all happening very early in the morning, you remember? Probably between the hours of maybe 2 o'clock or so, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Well, in Mark 15, as we come into this, at the beginning of this chapter, we are now coming into daylight. It's now maybe about 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning. And what we are seeing now is the final aspect of the Jewish trial. You remember that I've said to you before that there were two formal trials that Jesus Christ underwent. He underwent a religious trial that had th three phases to it. And he underwent a civil trial that had three phases to it as well. Sometimes commentators say to us that Jesus underwent uh, six trials. I think the better way to see it, as I said before, two trials, three phases to each trial. And in this in this second trial, in this uh, uh, coming before Pilate, what we're going to see here today is how our Lord Jesus Christ is brought before Pilate with these charges that will morph from a religious charge into a civil charge, and then they will accuse him in such a way. What we're going to see is Pilate is going to realize that, that Jesus of Nazareth is being railroaded. He realizes, again, Pilate was not inept. Pilate had, had an element of savvy about him. Now, again, Pilate is not without fault in this whole thing. Pilate truly is guilty of, uh, of, 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 of convicting or of, of, of bringing Jesus Christ uh, to the cross. But there's a sense in which we see Pilate trying to, trying to get out of this situation that he finds himself in. But he will, not be, uh, he will not be equal to the task as the Jewish leaders will outmaneuver him at every turn. And what we're going to see, however, primarily is this. Our Lord Jesus Christ is going to be presented to the nation at large. Pilate, in an attempt to, to avoid the stickiness of this situation, is going to bring the Lord Jesus Christ out in front of the people and say, I have a, there you have a custom that I would release to you a, a someone during the time of the Passover. Would you have Barabbas or would you have Jesus? And what we're going to see is that the nation rejects the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the theme I want to develop. They make a choice, and that choice is a rejection of Jesus Christ. And what I want to set before you today is that each and every one of us must deal with this choice of either Barabbas or Jesus, either ourselves or Jesus, either the things that we would want or the things that the world would call us to or Jesus. And I hope by the, the opening up of Scripture that I can bring you to that place where you are aware that even in this moment you must make a choice. And so I hope to do this by the grace of God here this morning. And so again, let's take a look at, um, at uh, Mark chapter 15, and we'll begin at verse 1. Mark chapter 15, and we'll read together verses 1 through 14. Once again, please hear the word of God. Mark chapter 15. And straightway in the morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes, and the whole council bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answering said unto him, Thou sayest it. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing. So that Pilate marveled. Now at the feast he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with, the, with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude, crying aloud, began to desire to do, I'm sorry, began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had delivered him for envy. But the chief priest moved the people that they should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said unto them again, What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. 
Then Pilate said unto them, Why, what evil, what evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. And we'll stop there for right now. What we're seeing in this passage of Scripture is really something of a, of a theme that we find in a number of places throughout Scripture. And that is this un inexplicable theme of man's rejection of God as God makes overtures of grace to him. It's inexplicable, isn't it? Over and over again, we see in Scripture how humanity rejects the offers of God. Whether humanity is rejecting the offer of God by way of uh, uh, God's word coming to them, by way of uh, God sending prophets to them, or by way of even him sending his son. We find this theme over and over again in scripture of the rejection of God, his ways, his prophets, and especially his son. It's amazing how many times we see this in scripture as a matter of fact. Listen to these passages of Scripture. The first one that I would bring to your attention, it's the first one that comes to my mind when I think of any time our Lord Jesus Christ being rejected. It's that great passage in Isaiah chapter 53, uh, verse 3. We read the following. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Here today we will see our Lord Jesus Christ despised and rejected. Barabbas or Jesus, who would you take? Oh, Jesus was despised and he was rejected. Other times in Scripture, in the Old Testament as well, we see this idea, this rejection of the overtures of God's grace. I think another one of those most telling times is found in the history of Israel. When Israel was, was, uh, was very early in their history, and there was a Samuel. He was, uh, he was ruling them. He was judging them. He was, in a very real sense, uh, the de facto leader of that nation. And you remember the people of Israel said at that time, after Samuel's sons had tragically failed and sinfully failed, we would say, uh, there was that time when the people of Israel, Israel no longer desired Samuel's leadership, but they wanted the king like the other nations. And do you remember what God says about that period in history? Listen to what we read here in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 6 through 8. But the thing displeased Samuel, this, this, this longing for a king. The thing displeased Samuel when they said, God, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the, of the people, and all that they say unto thee. Now listen to this. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. You see, there is again this, this theme, we would even call it a, a motif, of the rejection of the authority of God over the lives of individuals. And I ask you this question. When God comes to you, and God's word and God's promise comes to you in such a way as that Jesus Christ has presented to you, not only as Savior, but as Lord, how do you respond to that? Do you willingly take up this idea that Jesus Christ is, yes, Savior, but he's Lord as well, and you long for him to be Lord over all of life? To reject this is to fall prey to this, to this sinful theme that we see throughout Scripture. In us, in, in, uh, later in 1 Samuel chapter 10, uh, verse, seven, uh, verse 19, Samuel is recounting this, this day in which they called for a human king to rule over them rather than to have God rule over them. 1 Samuel 10, 19, And ye have this day rejected your God who himself saved you out of all your all, all of your adversities and your tribulations, and ye have said unto him, No, but set a king over us. And so again, this, this theme of, of rejection. When, when, uh, when, the, when the history of, uh, of the northern kingdom of Israel is, uh, is being summarized in 2 Kings uh, chapter 17, verse 15, this is the statement that's made about them. And they rejected his statutes and his covenants that, that he made with their fathers and his testimonies which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain. In other words, they followed idolatry. And they went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like unto them. Oh, isn't this a word for the church today? The heathen that are around us. How many times, again, are, we, are our hearts drawn away by the things that the world offers to us? And so oftentimes these things even creep into the church of God, and it should not be. And so again, this idea, this theme of rejecting God and his ways. In Jeremiah chapter 15, 6, uh, the, the God himself laments of this rejection, and he says this in Isaiah, I'm sorry, in Jeremiah 15, 6, 
You have rejected me, declares the Lord. You keep going backwards, and so I have stretched out my hand against you and destroyed you. I am weary of relenting. And God is basically saying in this point to the people, uh, to the people now of Judah, the southern kingdom, that their, their sin, they were so insistent in their sins. Can I say it this way? They were so addicted to their sins that judgment must come. This idea of the, the rejection of God takes on a, something of a recurring theme in, uh, in Ezekiel chapter 20 in three passages very closely, uh, very closely compacted together. We find God saying this through the prophet, but the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statutes, but rejected my rules, by which if a person does them, he shall live. And my Sabbaths they have greatly profaned. Thence I said I would pour out my wrath upon them in the wilderness to make a full end of them. That's this one passage in Ezekiel 20. That's verse 13, verse 16. Because they rejected my rules and did not walk in my statutes and profaned my Sabbaths, for their heart went after, went after their idols. In verse 24, because they have obeyed not my rules, but have rejected my statutes and profaned my Sabbaths, and their eyes were set on their father's idols. What do we see here? We see, that we see this thing of rejecting God. How could it be? Why could it be? How, what is it about human nature that thinks that its best ends are served in the, served in the rejection of God? It's, an, it's, it's a bewildering thing, isn't it? But we all know that struggle, do we not? We might, not have a, we might not have the main Barabbas in front of us, but we have all the all that Barabbas represents within us. And we must make that choice, must we not? That we will take Christ rather than Barabbas. This theme of rejection carries over into the New Testament and centers on the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Again, Jesus again prophesies of this in, in Luke chapter 9, verse 22, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be slain and be raised again the third day. This is where we're at in Mark 15. This is this rejection of the elders and the chief priests. Luke chapter 17, he, he reiterates the, the, uh, the, the prophecy. Luke chapter 17, verse 25 but first, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. I find it interesting here that what we're seeing here is our Lord is saying that not only will there be an official rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ by way of the, by way of the leadership, there will be a, a rejection by way of the populace as well. And then, of course... We have, um, uh, we, have, uh, we have Peter uh, preaching on this rejection in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. And you are come unto him as a living stone, rejected by men, in the sight of, but in the sight of God, chosen, chosen and precious. Well, all of this was, was prophesied by our Lord Jesus Christ in, earlier in the Gospel of Mark, in Mark chapter 10, uh, verses 33 and 34. And when our Lord said the following, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. And that's already taking place in Mark 14. And they shall deliver him unto the Gentiles. And that's going to take place in Mark 15 here. And they shall mock him and scourge him, and they shall spit upon him, and they shall kill him. But he wasn't done. And the third day he shall rise again. Remember how we said that, our Lord, that when we were talking about the future, when our Lord Jesus Christ, before, uh, before, the, uh, before Caiaphas, uh, said that he indeed was the Son of the Blessed, and you shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of great glory. Remember how we said that the future belongs to Jesus Christ? The future belongs to Christ. And where will you be in that future? Will, be, will, you be, will, will, will you be there with Christ in that day? And I hope and I pray each and every one of us can say yes to that. And so here is our Lord Jesus Christ laying all these things before us by way, as I said before, this, this, this theme, this, this, this rejection motif, we might say. Well, that leads me to formulate the following proposition for you or the following doctrine, the point that I want to preach from, and it's this. Jesus Christ was so despised and rejected that when offered to have him set free, his own people called for his crucifixion and, and chose a murderer instead. Let me say this again. Jesus Christ was so despised and rejected that when offered to have him set free, his own people called for his crucifixion and chose a murderer instead. Rick read this morning from John chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. 
You see, again, that's what we're reading of here. But to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And so he may have been rejected in that day. He may be rejected now. But what about in this, what about in this sanctuary? What about in this church? Is he being rejected or is he being accepted? And I'm saying to you that if you accept the Lord Jesus Christ, you again will be a child of God. Oh, these choices that are ever before us. These choices where again, is it, it, it's either Barabbas or Christ. It's either self or Christ. What will it be this day? Amen. You know, we'll come to the end. We'll come to the end of our sermon today, and, and we're going to see Pilate ask one of these questions. It's amazing to see during the trial of our Lord Jesus Christ how many times very significant questions, very weighty questions, are set forth on the pages of Scripture. And in, and in uh, verse 12 of Mark 15, we, we, we will read that Pilate will say this What will ye then that I should do unto him whom ye call king of the Jews? What should I do with this one called Jesus? And I ask you the question. What should you do with this one called Jesus? The question is going to be set before you today. The question can be answered whether or not you will come to this table. You see, here is our Lord Jesus Christ being set before us and the choice again must be made. And so again, the doctrine, Jesus Christ was so despised and rejected that when he, that when he, when, he, when, when, when there was an offer to have him set free, his own people called for his crucifixion and chose a murderer instead. Well, what I want to do as I work through this passage of Scripture, developing this, uh, this point, I want, to, I want to work through the passage of Scripture as we normally do along, along three points. And the three points are essentially this. We're going to see that Jesus Christ is religiously rejected. He's rejected by the religious authorities. We're going to see that in the first part of verse 1. The second thing we're going to see is that Jesus Christ is rejected by the civil authorities. We're going to see that basically in verses 2 down through, uh, down to, uh, through 6, uh, rejected by civil authorities. And then we're going to see that Jesus is rejected by, by individuals. So he's going to be rejected by religious authority. He's going to be rejected by civil authority. And then he's going to be rejected by personal choice. Personal choice. The whole, the whole dynamic of the soul before God really comes down to this whole idea of personal choice. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe and I love the doctrines of grace. I believe and I love the fact that through this all, God is, is superintending these whole things. You know, we're going to see our Lord Jesus Christ and Barabbas set before the people. And, 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 Pilate, the, and Pilate has the ability to pardon whoever the people would choose. And if they would have chose Christ, Pilate had the ability to pardon Jesus Christ. But in one sense, Jesus Christ cannot be pardoned. Because only a guilty man can be pardoned. There's no sin that attaches to Jesus Christ. And God's superintending of all of this. God's, God's, God's uh, working all of this. And yet, what do we see in the forefront? We see the free choice of men being exercised here. Most of it's being exercised to the detriment of their own souls. And so we'll work through these passages of Scripture. Now, I have to admit, in, this pa in, our, in our sermon today, our sermon is going to be somewhat, uh, if I can say it this way, informative. What I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to uh, work through uh, the, actual, uh, the actual experience of our Lord Jesus Christ on that early morning. We want to kind of fill in some of the blanks uh, that we have in the gospel account of Mark. And what do I mean by that? When Mark is writing his gospel, he's writing for a very specific end. He's not giving us all the details. All the gospel writers do that. They have a specific purpose for which they're writing. And that, under, under the direction of the Spirit of God, very much dictates what they, what they include in, the gospel, or in their gospel account and what they maybe pass over in their gospel account. But we can bring all these things together. One of the things I just want you to be aware of then as we come to verse 1. Let's take a look at verse 1 of uh, Mark 15. And straightway in the morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him on the pot. Now what we're seeing here at this point, this is now the third phase of the religious trial that Jesus Christ underwent. This, in one sense, is that phase of the, uh, of the religious trial that gives a stamp of legality to all that happened. Because prior to this, the trial of Jesus Christ was marked by great illegalities. 
You remember I said last week that one, uh, one author uh, says that there were 21 different infraction, legal infractions uh, during the various trials that our Lord Jesus Christ underwent. Uh, there he was, again, being examined in the, in the, in, in, in the private residence of, uh, of, uh, of the man who was kind of the power behind the power, this man, Annas, who was the high priest. Uh, we see that in John. We're going to get to that here shortly. And then he was examined again at night uh, in, the ho- in, in, in the personal residence of Caiaphas. Again, this was all illegal. And then uh, Caiaphas was seeking out witnesses not to, not to exculpate, not, not that Jesus Christ might be uh, freed from these charges, but they were seeking out false witnesses to condemn him. Again, this was illegal. Uh, there, was, uh, there was Caiaphas uh, no longer acting as judge, but now acting as prosecutor, putting Jesus Christ under an oath, uh, whether or not he were the Son of God. So there were so many illegalities taking place. Only part of the council was, was, uh, uh, was uh, present at that time. So now in Mark chapter 15, verse 1, when we read that the whole council was together, this was to give this air, this veneer of legality to everything that was going on. But there are, there's a number of other things that I want you to be aware of as well. As I said before, uh, this is probably about 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, Jesus, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ had already been examined by Annas, uh, the high priest. And I guess I have to say a little bit about this man, Annas, the high priest. He was one of these men that, again, that if we knew him from just strictly a, uh, a personal point of view and, and strictly a man by way of what he accomplished in his life, this was another one of these men that accomplished much in his life. And he was one of these guys that even though he was no longer uh, you know, active on the scene, he was still the power behind everything that was going on. Uh, he was the high priest uh, from about 6 A.D. to about 14 or 15 A.D. It's kind of interesting in the Old Testament, the office of, a high, of the high priest was a lifetime office. Uh, the Romans kind of curtailed that. And what the Romans would do is that the Romans would uh, pretty much appoint in one way or another uh, who the high priest would be. It would enable them to kind of uh, uh, control, manipulate the, uh, the, the, the high priest. Annas was, again, such an influential man that he had six relatives of his that succeeded him as the high priest. Five of them were, were his physical sons, and the fifth one, I'm sorry, and the sixth one, Caiaphas, uh, was, uh, uh, was his son-in-law. And Caiaphas is the man who, uh, by way of Roman authority, is recognized as the high priest there. But it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that when Jesus is arrested, he goes to the household of Annas first. And we have this in, in John 18. And in John 18, verse 13, we read the following, And they led him away to Annas first. For he was the father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. And then we read on in verses 19 through 24, the exchange that took place between the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, uh, and, and Annas in that early morning hour. Verse 19 of John 18, the high priest, Annas, therefore asked Jesus of his disciples and his teaching. And Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogues and in, in, in the temple where all the Jews come together. And in secret I spake nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them that heard me what I spake unto them. Behold, these know the things that I have said. And when he had said this, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? And Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? Annas therefore, verse 24, Annas therefore sent him bound unto Caiaphas the high priest. In one sense, that was the first phase of the religious trial. Some have said that, uh, that, this, uh, that this, uh, this examination was, uh, was being conducted something like a grand jury, a grand jury inquiry uh, to see whether or not the charges were there. Annas again examines him, treats him uh, wrongly, uh, then moves him on to Caiaphas. And this is, again, you might remember what I was saying. So remember last week we were talking about that courtyard that Peter was in? So Annas' residence would have been on one side of the courtyard, Caiaphas's residence would have been on the other side. They would have taken Jesus from Annas' uh, residence over into Caiaphas's residence. And at that time, there would have been the, the formal uh, uh, or that, that, that illegal questioning uh, on the part of Caiaphas. Now, it's interesting that when we see our Lord Jesus Christ with Caiaphas, this is now the second aspect of the trial. And we went over that a couple of weeks ago. I'll not repeat much of it, only to say this. You remember, Caiaphas puts Jesus under an oath, Art thou the son of the blessed? Uh, and again, our Lord Jesus Christ answers in the, in the affirmative. And because of that, they accuse him of blasphemy. Now, in a sense, this is what they were always trying to get Jesus uh, convicted of. 
We see this back as early as John chapter 10, verse 33. The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. You ever hear these people say, well, Jesus never declared himself, never said that he was God? Well, here's a passage here where, again, he's taking the task and he's almost put to death. They attempt to kill him, but they can't kill him at that time. One of the reasons why they can't kill him at that time, if they were to kill him, how would they, how would they put him to death? They would put him to death by stoning. That's not how the Messiah is to die. He is to die under the curse of God, hanging on a tree, hanging on a cross. And so, again, they've been, they've been, they've been aiming at this charge for, for, for quite a while now. And so now we see again the, that, that, uh, that interview, that, that aspect, that phase of the trial with Caiaphas. Now we're, in verse, now we're in chapter 15. Now we have the third phase of the trial. Mark treats it very briefly. However, Luke gives us more information as to what was going on. In Luke chapter 22, verses 66 through, 60, uh, through 71, we read the following. And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together and led him into their council. Now what we're seeing here is this. Now this is the formal, this is the third aspect of the trial. And we're having some information as to what's going on on this third aspect of the trial. It's daylight. It's no longer under the cover of darkness. The entire council is gathered together. And they ask him the following in, that, in, in verse 67. Art thou the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I also ask you, you will not answer me, nor let me go. Hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. And they, sa and they said all, Art thou then the Son of God? And he saith unto them, Ye say that I am. And you have to remember when you have this thing, Ye say that I am. This is an affirmation on the part of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not an evasive answer on the part of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is an, this is an affirmation. Verse 71, and they said, What need we of any further witnesses? For we ourselves have heard this out of his own mouth. Now, what should have happened, there should have been a day in between the actual, um, the actual um, uh, verdict and the carrying out of the execution. But again, that did not take, take place. There was another, again, illegality. Now, it, around this same time, these men are now gathered, as I said before, giving an air of legality to the whole proceeding. Around this same time, somebody pops back in to the whole account. And who comes back in is none other than Judas himself. Judas at this point, right around this time, Judas is coming back to these men whom he had agreed with to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And now there he is, not under genuine repentance, but under the weight of psychological remorse. His conscience, in a sense, is killing him. The oldest thing of conscience, you know. And there it was, Judas, unable to live with conscience. And we read this in Matthew chapter 27, verses 3 through 5. Then Judas, the betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned. So when he saw that Jesus was condemned, changed his mind. The King James says repented, but changed the mind is a better translation there. And brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, and they said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and went out and hanged himself. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. Judas comes to these chief priests and he says, I've, I've sinned and that I've betrayed innocent blood. And what did the chief priest say to him? What's that to us? You deal with it. Don't ever be surprised when sinners entice you along the way and you find yourself in a situation where you don't want to be because of your own sinful choice or the influence of others when you turn around and say, what did you get me into? The sinners say to you, what brother is that to me? You're the one that made the choice. You deal with it. Sinners can care less about you, you understand. Amen. Let them find, let, them, uh, let, let their influence lead you into sin. Do you think they care? And, and, and I'm saying this, especially to those of you who are younger. Anthony, I'm sorry, and I am, I'm speaking to you. That sinners will entice you to, 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 to follow you, to, to, to go into sin. Don't listen to them. They don't care about your soul. They only care for what they think is fun in the moment. Adults, I say to you as well. You see, this, this, this enticement of sin... You, do you think sinners care about your eternal destiny? Christ does. 
Your brothers and sisters in this church do. And so again, Judas is brought back into our attentive to our attention. And so again, this was, as I said before, this was the uh, this was the the kind of the the uh, the final phase of the Jewish trial. Now again, Mark fifteen verse one, they they have their their trial. Now they bring him the pilot, and we see that in the second part of uh, of uh, uh, verse one of chapter fifteen. And the whole council bound Jesus and carried him away unto Pilate. Now what's interesting, at once again, is that. Mark is not giving us uh, all the details. Mark is kind of going uh, in, in a quick line. And I think where Mark is purposely going is that Mark is going to that place where he's going to show us how that Jesus is rejected uh, by his own, by his own, uh, by his own uh, countrymen, by his own people. There's a sense in which Mark is really emphasizing that aspect. Mark wants us to see that there's a real choice that has to be made, either Christ or Barabbas. But there is information along the way that we should be aware of. I think it's helpful that we're aware of it. And the first thing, that, again, that I want you to be aware of is that we have in between verse 1, we have in between verse 1 and verse 2 a, a, a number of other details that I want to bring to your attention. And the first thing that I want to bring to your attention is found again in Mark chapter, I'm sorry, in, in Luke 23, verses 13 and 15. Now, we have this. And, when, and Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people, said unto him, You have brought this man unto me as one that perverts the people. And behold, I, having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof you accuse him. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is found in him. So what we see now is that in between verses 1 and 2 of Mark 15, Jesus is examined by Pilate, and then Pilate understands that Jesus is a Galilean, and that was Herod's jurisdiction. And so Jesus, uh, so, I'm sorry, so Pilate sends Jesus to Herod, to be examined by Herod. And when he is examined by Herod, Herod too, Herod also finds no fault in him. Herod abuses him, but this becomes the second aspect of the civil trial. The first aspect, when, when uh, Jesus is brought by the high priest, the second aspect, when he is sent to Herod, and in both cases, they find nothing, again, worthy of death in the Lord Jesus, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I said before, it's interesting to see some of these details and we see this in verses, uh, in Luke 23, uh, I, I, I got ahead of myself and forgive me for that. But in Luke 23, verses 6 through 12, we read the following. Well, let me, let me say this, I'm, I'm getting ahead of my notes and forgive me for that. Jesus is brought to Pilate by the religious leaders and they make accusation against him. Now notice in, in, in Mark, it's very, it's very quick, it's very, it's very much to the point. Again, the chief priests uh, held, uh, uh, you know, brought, bound Jesus and, and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And then in verse 2, Pilate asked, Are thou the king of the Jews? And he answering, saying unto him, Thou saith it, saith it. Now what's interesting, as I said, is I'm trying to point, I'm trying to make it, I'm stumbling here, forgive me for that. The point that I'm trying to make is that in between here, there are accusations leveled against Jesus by the high priest that Mark doesn't record, but Luke does. And this is what we see in Luke chapter 23, verses 1 through 5. And the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. And this is what they did. And began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ the king. And Pilate said, said unto him, Are you the king of the Jews? And, G and, and he answered him, saying, Thou sayest it. That's what we have in verse 2 in Mark, in, in Mark uh, chapter 15. And what I want you to see here now is that you have this accusation that's leveled against Jesus by the high priest that, go, that morphs from a religious offense into a civil offense. Religiously, he's accused of blasphemy. That's not going to work with, with Pilate. Pilate's not going to execute Jesus uh, for, for claiming to be Messiah. That was nothing that he would have been able to put him to death for. But if they could morph that from a religious charge into a civil charge, now they will get Pilate to do their evil work. And that's why when they, when they bring Jesus before Pilate, the single charge of blasphemy turns into a four-point civil charge. Listen to it again. He's perverting the nation. He's forbidding to give uh, tribute to Caesar. 
Didn't he say, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, and unto God the things that are God? He is, a, he, is a, he, is, he is calling himself Christ the King. And so again, they don't say Christ the Messiah, they say Christ the King. And it's a very interesting thing. They know that the, that the Messiah is the King, but they know that but the, in, in their framework, that idea of Christ ruling and reigning had more religious overtones than anything else. It had, it had political overtones as well, but it was primarily religious overtones that it had. And that's what they are pointing out in order for Pilate to pick that up. And then the fourth thing that they say is that he is stirring up the t uh, uh, people, teaching throughout all, uh, all Jew Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. So in other words, this man is creating all kind of political turmoil. Uh, this man, Jesus of Nazareth, again, is going about saying we're not to pay taxes to Caesar. That would have been a serious charge. This man, Jesus of Nazareth, is making himself out to be a king and having people follow him. And so the religious charge of blasphemy morphs into the civil charge of insurrection and claiming to be a king and forbidding to pay taxes. Now, Pilate, ex Pilate knows what's going on. Pilate's not like some dunce. And it's kind of interesting to see the, the interplay between, between the, uh, the Jewish leaders and Pilate. Again, I'll not read the passages. I'll just kind of go over them very quickly here. So in John, in, in the Gospel of John, uh, they go to uh, Pilate. And you remember, they're, they're so concerned about their religious purity that they won't even enter in to the place where Pilate is at. They didn't want to defile themselves in order to, that they might still keep the Passover. This is a, this is a bizarre thing. You have men acting wickedly who are doing their best to maintain the outward appearance of their religious conformity. It's a very, very strange thing. Sin is a, sin, what sin does uh, to the reasoning processes is, is an amazing thing. It's interesting that Pilate, in a sense, accommodates them. He goes out to meet them, and he asks for the charge. And when he begins to get the charge, he begins to examine the Lord Jesus Christ. He realizes that the Lord Jesus Christ is being railroaded. He realizes that uh, this, is all, this is all a sham. And so what Pilate does, again, in a, in, 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 in a sense, in a sense, he shows himself to be kind of like a, a just man, but he shows himself not to be up to do what's ultimately right. He's not going to allow Jesus to be railroaded in one sense, but neither is he going to take a stand and do what he knows is right. In a sense... Pilate is trying to be a very tactful politician because he knows if he just dismisses the charge of the Jewish leaders, there's going to be potential problems. And so what he tries to do is he tries to find some technicality that would, uh, that would, uh, that would uh, exempt him from any kind of accusation because, again, the law says what it says. And so he goes through all these kind of things in order, to, in, in order to release Jesus. He examines him and he says, I find no fault in him. The, the pushback comes to, to, to Pilate. Again, we've, we've found him guilty. Remember they said, he asked the question, well, what's the charge against him? And they say, if he, if he wasn't guilty, we, we would have brought him to you. And Pilate says, wait a minute, that's not going to happen. You're not just going to bring him into my, into my court, in, in a sense, into my courtroom and just have me convict him without charges. Again, there is some decency, some respectability about Pilate. Not that we're going to get, not that, not that Pilate's off the hook. He's not. But all these things are going on. And so in all this, what we are seeing, Pilate is making an attempt to release the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this, Pilate realizes that there was a custom that on the feast of the Passover, he would release to the population the one who they desired. And that's where we pick it up here in, verses, uh, in, in verse uh, 6 of Mark 15. Now, he that, now, now at that feast, he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with, with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude, crying aloud, began to desire him to do whatsoever he had done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Now this is interesting. Look at verse 10. For he knew that the chief priest had delivered him, had delivered him for envy. In other words, he's seeing through what the chief priests are trying to do here. And so, as I said before, in trying to be tactful, in trying to kind of appease all the groups, 
enabled in order to be able to say before uh, Caesar that he did not let an insurrectionist uh, just uh, 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 proclaim that he was king in order to get him off the hook with the Jewish leaders he would put the Lord Jesus Christ or Barabbas before the people wasn't Jesus of Nazareth just acclaimed a week before as the king of the Jews wasn't there this uh, this great reception of the Lord Jesus Christ as he came into Nazareth uh, I'm sorry as he came into J Jerusalem Pilate must have been thinking that this was a, this this was an easy thing this was like a slam dunk who would choose Barabbas over Jesus? But isn't that what sin does? It, it brings us to these, to these idiotic choices. Oh, I'm sorry, or these idiotic decisions. It makes us choose one thing against the, against the well-being of our own soul. And so again, Pilate is thinking again that this will be the way in which, Jesus, in which he can get out of this situation. And he sets before the people Barabbas or, or the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's interesting because Barabbas is actually guilty of the very things that they accuse Jesus of. He was guilty of insurrection. He was guilty of murder, even worse. The very, many of the very things that Jesus is accused of, Barabbas himself is guilty of. And so in all of this, we see that Pilate is thinking that this will be a certain way out of it. But what do we have here? We have here, the, again, the, uh, uh, the, uh, when, when the, when the, when the uh, option is put in front of the people, what ends up happening? Isn't it amazing, in one of the other gospel accounts we read, but the chief priest stirred up the people to choose Barabbas rather than, rather than Jesus? The chief priest stirred up the people. There's something to be said for the ability of influence. There's something to be said for the ability of people and authority to influence. There's something to be said for the wickedness of religious men who under the guise of, of piety will actually consign Jesus Christ to death. What is it about the wickedness of the hearts of men? You and I, we may have influence on others. All of us do have to some degree. If you're here as a parent or a grandparent, you have influence. Some of you in your circle of friends may be influential. And these high priests, what are they doing? They are using their influence to put the Lord Jesus Christ to death. It is a very, very wicked thing. And so they put, the, uh, Pilate puts this choice before them. And then a strange turn takes place. Notice what we have here again in verse 12. And Pilate answered and said unto them, What will ye then that I shall do? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, verse 11. Uh, but the chief priests moved the people, and that they should release rather Barabbas unto them. And then verse 12, and Pilate answered and said again unto them, What were ye then that I should do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? This is, a, this, is a, this is one of these, as I said before, one of these weighty questions. What will I do with Jesus? What will I do with this one who is called king of the Jews? Not only is Pilate answering, asking this question, this is a question that's before us as well. But back to Pilate anyway, and back to this situation. What shall I do unto him that ye call king of the Jews? And they cried out again, crucify him. Here is this insistence of the crowd and the rejection of Jesus Christ. And this is what I want you to see on top of it. In verse 14, And then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And he cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. What evil has he done? No explanation. No answer is given. It doesn't matter. They just cry out the more vehemently, the more insistently, Crucify him. I want you to see something about the nature of evil in the nature of sin. Did you notice how when Peter was being tempted in a sense with his denials, how his denials went from kind of a nonchalant, I don't know what you're talking about, to a more insistent, I'm not one of the man's the disciples, to swearing with an oath before God, I don't even know who the man is. This is that increasing power of wickedness. And what is it that brings this crowd to say, to, to make a choice of Barabbas over Jesus, and then to repeat that he should be crucified, and then to insist that he should be crucified. What is it about the power of evil? And what I want you to see and what I want you to understand is that this is the nature of evil itself. Evil will always seek dominance in whatever it is doing. Evil will persuade, and evil will, e evil will even seem to just stay there, kind of, kind of in neutral, until the time is right to spring. But when it springs, oftentimes you turn around, and what you begin to notice is this, is that it had been creeping up and creeping in all the time. And before you know it, there you are with the crowd saying, crucify him, crucify him. Do you think upon reflection, everybody that, there, that was there that day would have thought that what they said was, 
was, was, was actually the best thing that they could have said. And what I want you to see here, as I said before, is this increasing power of sin. Here, here, here are the crowds. And what are they doing? They are calling, they are insisting that Jesus Christ be crucified. Here we see a progression of their hatred. Here we see a progression of wickedness working against them. And so in all of this, what I'm trying to set before you today is once again the reality of the ch of choices that we have. We don't have an actual Barabbas in front of us today, but a choice still has to be made concerning Christ. It's not Barabbas that we must ask whether or not we will choose him over Christ, but it's, his, but it's, a, it's our own desires, or it's the influence of a sinful world. And I ask you today, who will you choose? Will you choose Christ or will you choose Barabbas? Will you choose Christ or will you choose the world? Will you choose Christ or will you choose your sin? My brothers and sisters, both young and old, I encourage you to choose Jesus Christ this morning. Look to him in faith and receive him by faith. To all that received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God even to those that believe on his name. One more thing I want you to see about Barabbas, and many commentators and preachers bring this out. Barabbas forms for us a wonderful picture of the gospel, does he not? You might say, well, how is that? Well, here was this man Barabbas, as guilty as the day is long. A man Barabbas, guilty of great sins, sins for which he would be put to death. There were three crosses uh, on the hill of Calvary that day. And those three crosses were originally erected for Barabbas and his two compatriots. Those three crosses, again, were set up for men that were guilty of real crimes. And because of the attempt of Pilate to get out of the situation when he should have just stepped up to it, and because of the outmaneuvering of the religious leaders of Pilate, the choice was made and Barabbas would be set free. Barabbas knew that he was a guilty man worthy of death. Barabbas knew that Jesus Christ was not guilty of anything. Barabbas also knew that when Jesus paid his debt, when Jesus paid for his crime, Barabbas could never be accused of that crime. In other words, Barabbas was given a true and free pardon. Jesus could not be pardoned. He was not guilty. But Barabbas could. And the picture is this. You and I stand as guilty as Barabbas before a holy God. And you and I are under the wrath of God, but you and I have a, have a substitute who died in our place, and that substitute was Jesus of Nazareth. My friends, will you receive him by faith? This idea of a pardon is very interesting, and as I said before, this is a very, this is a very common uh, theme that, uh, that preachers go down when, when, when this passage of Scripture is examined. I've, I've, get, I've given it maybe a different point of emphasis Many of the preachers do go down this path of Barabbas. And, and a number of preachers have brought out an interesting detail from history. And it's this. They talk about the reality of, of, of pardons. Uh, people can be pardoned for their crimes. Now, we know that whenever our presidents that are elected come to the end of their four years or eight years, it's very common that they will issue presidential pardons. Um, and it's interesting that in history... Uh, the, the case is made that there were at least two pardons for capital crimes that people rejected. One was in, I believe the man had committed a crime in, um, I think it was in 1897. In uh, 1930, he was issued a pardon. He rejected that pardon and he was executed, I'm sorry, he died a natural death in 1960. Another more telling case was a man by the name of George Wilson. Uh, I think in 1827, he had... Uh, he had uh, committed uh, robbery. He had, he had stolen the mail uh, as a capital offense. Then he had stolen the mail, but he had committed murder in the process as well. And um, Andrew Jackson, the president, a few years later, had offered him a pardon, but he but he refused the pardon. And so the 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 uh, the authorities didn't know what to do with this man who had been granted a, a presidential pardon, but who had rejected it. And so the case went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled that if a pardon is rejected, the execution must be carried out. Mm -hmm. My friends, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. A pardon for all your sins is being offered to you this morning. 
Should you reject that pardon, the wrath of God must fall upon your soul. Jesus Christ died in your place. And I ask you, I implore with you, I say to you in the words of Scripture, Oh, why will you perish? Why will you die when one has died in your place? What a picture of Calvary. What a picture of the gospel. What a picture of the love of God in giving to us a substitute, a Savior, who is Jesus Christ. I set before you the choice again this morning. Barabbas, yourself, or Christ. And should you choose for Christ, then come to his table this morning. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, give us grace, we, see, we pray, to see in these, in, these, in these grave and ultimate decisions that we must make. Give us grace, we pray, to choose according to the grace that you offer us, that we might embrace Jesus Christ by faith. And we ask and we pray this in his holy name. Amen.